So, welcome everyone. Um, we are here at the Open Eye Gallery. My name is Lorenzo Fusi, I'm the director, and I'm also curating the show which we are uh, presenting for the Liverpool Biennial 2014. The title of the exhibition is Not All Documents Are Records, and uh, the exhibition includes the work of four different artists from different generations and different backgrounds. And the core uh, of the exhibition is to try to think about, think about photography in relationship to exhibition making and exhibition displays. Um, photography is, is a quite an ambivalent medium per se because of course it can be used in a quite mundane, functional fashion but also can have a, an artistic intention. So we're basically thinking about documentation as both the site where artworks can be created as well as pure documentation of events that have been residing or happening in the past. So the exhibition includes, uh, as I said, four different artists. We have Hans Hacke, we have uh, Ira Lombardia, we have uh, the work of Italian photographer who's called, whose name is uh, Hugo Mullers, and also we've been commissioning a new work to Cristina de Midel, who's today with us. So thank you, Cristina, for being here. Thank you. And most importantly, thank you for the work you've been doing for this exhibition. And um, the idea was to use the work of the artist uh, on show to unpack the notion of documentation both as an artistic expression as well as a, uh, as a record of the past. Um, Christina, you have been involved in the process uh, and of course like you know a new commission is a very different thing from presenting pre-existing work in uh, an exhibition context so we have been kind of going through the entire process of uh, you know the realm of ideas the notion of feasibility how to make it happening and we came out with an outcome which is slightly different from the one we discussed initially yes. uh, but that is a good thing we both think so. oh yes we agree on that <laughs> so maybe before to speak more specifically about the work which is surrounding us which is Christina's contribution to the Liverpool Biennial uh, this year it would be probably uh, useful for our audience is to get to know you a little bit better and maybe mm -hmm. we can speak about your background and how well first and foremost how did you end up uh, using here photography with you. and then <laughs> here with me <laughs> specifically uh, well I am a, a, well when I describe myself and every time I give a bio I say I'm a photojournalist but I have to change that because well my background is in documentary photography I was a staff photographer in newspapers for more than 10 years and then like three years ago I decided well I got tired and bored about uh, this use this such limited use of photography when you're telling a story mm -hmm. that I gave myself uh, one sabbatical year and tried my own way and that's when I did a, a project called the Afronauts it's like halfway between documentation and imagination and I found myself so comfortable in that gray zone that uh, I'm still here so I challenge what I tried to challenge my work how we consume images, especially photographic, photographic images and how the media uh, also play with that and how we can just push the boundaries to see what we consume as an image, as a document and what we consume as art. So. But then you know, by saying that uh, originally you were describing yourself professionally as a photojournalist, would you say now that you are an artist using photography? I would say like maybe the most accurate description of what I do now would be a visual storyteller and I don't like to be categorized as photojournalist mm. be because it's not true I'm not publishing in, in newspapers anymore but I'm not strictly an artist that just shows work or that just produces work to be shown and sold in galleries because I, I produce books and I try to and, and there is the performative part in the production of the images because I involve people around and it's just all mixed, very mm -hmm. funny. And so, I mean, I'm thinking now about the uh, Afronauts that you quickly uh, referred to, uh, which was an incredibly successful project. And that's one of the reasons why I'm here with you. <laughs> <laughs> which is precisely possibly one of the reasons why you're here. But maybe we can just, can, can you tell us a little bit, of, like, first of all, if you were expecting such 
a positive oh. outcome because no no not at all if I had known what would happen with that series I would have been scared to death and would have <laughs> stayed paralyzed at home and <laughs> wouldn't have moved a finger uh, no of course I, 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 there's no way I could expect how just an idea that you develop in a free way with uh, like m almost everyone around you telling you no it's what are you doing are you crazy that it would just be a, uh, it would be like the beginning of a completely new career and, and, and a life changing experience mm. completely. And so that project basically entangled, if, as, far, as far as I can tell, there was the, the photographic prints which were displayed in a sort mm -hmm. of a, you know, exhibition mm -hmm. uh, uh, format. Uh, presentation and then but there was also a publication which I think is equally important to you and it was a self-published publication yeah. yeah so that was yes uh, I think the, the big part of the success of the series comes with uh, with the book because that was the first thing I did then I had to translate it into the mm. world so it was uh, conceived at the beginning as a, as a book and as I was completely alien to to the art to the arts world I just self-published it very naively and and it turned out very well very well so uh, yes it was a small publication I did 1000 which is not bad but it sold out uh, pretty fast mm. like in two weeks uh, because like some big names in the photo book world uh, decided it was a hot book and and yeah and then one thing after the other, the other. I did like 26 exhibitions last year and two more books and yeah and was the translation from the book format into the exhibition format difficult or you felt comfortable with it? Uh, it was difficult for me because I've always worked with printed matter mm. and, and for me it's, it's, it's always been about uh, a book, an object as a container of a, for the mm -hmm. story. Uh, either when I was working in newspapers or magazines because you have to edit, sure. so it's three or four pages. In my case it was 80 pages. But then it's completely different when you have to translate <laughs> it into the walls because you have the experience that it's completely different and um, and it's not such an intimate uh, way of consuming you're not alone you're not turning the pages at your rhythm you're completely involved in a in a space and and you have to adapt your story to make the best out of this new situation that is a space you have to fill with your work yeah but it's, it's challenging and I liked it I at the beginning I was not very very sure that it was good and then I've been improving slowly after 26, I guess. <laughs> you get there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and are you feeling comfortable in what you might define as the art world? Or uh, do you feel hmm. like an, as an outsider? Or what's your relationship to, you know, to, to the infrastructure well, of hmm. contemporary art? Well, I studied fine arts. Okay. So I was an outsider when I was in the media. Right. And now I am an outsider when I'm back in the arts world. So that's uh, maybe I think it's the curse that comes with my name, the middle. I'm always <laughs> like between one thing and the other. Yeah. Uh, and I, I like the fact of uh, being an outsider. Mm. I think it's very necessary. I mean, for me, I feel very comfortable being mm. an outsider because you can still judge and, and just understand things not from inside. From I, I think it's it's much more interesting sure. not to understand what you know, but try to understand what you don't know. So um, yes, I hope I, I, I'll be an outsider for the rest of my life. Mm. And also, I was very interested in in your definition of your area of exploration as a grey zone because mm -hmm. I think is what we're trying to do at the gallery as well. I mean, we're trying to think about photography uh, beyond the boxes or beyond mm. the categories that, you know, or classification that is normally used. So, you know, we are not very supportive of, of anything which is immediately rec recognizable or identifiable as a specific genre of photography. Mm -hmm. And so the gray zone is actually where we operate more uh, Happily, I'd say, as an institution. Uh, and actually, this is kind of bringing us to one of the reasons why we thought of you as a possible partner for this, um, for this exhibition, because it's really, the entire show is really about exploring the gray zone, the gray area between pure documentation and art making, uh, which is a very broad area and can be declined in many different ways and you can be very faithful in documenting exhibitions and yet retain your artistic autonomy in doing so mm -hmm. or you can you know explode the boundaries of what conventional documentation is normally about and go well beyond that classification and that uh, and that category so that takes me to 
the new commission and the work which is surrounding us. <laughs> so you, we discussed a very incredibly sim simple briefing, I think, because mm -hmm. uh, I was trying to combine together historical documentation of historical events and try to think about the now and possibly the future and try to imagine how can we record uh, very important international art platforms such as biennials in a way that is innovative, is engaging and possibly artistic in its intentions and not purely functional. Mm -hmm. And uh, because we were about to uh, set up an installation for the Liverpool Bank in 2014, the only thing which we were missing was actually something referring to the future. <laughs> the future or how you know the present is transforming into mm. the future and so I came up to you by saying would you be willing to imagine what the Liverpool Biennial might become visually and in terms of uh, how can photography better say it could record the Liverpool Biennial of the future uh, and you crazily say yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's why we are here. That's and another reason why we're here. <laughs> the second reason. And I think that would be probably um, interesting for the audiences to try to understand, you know, how our process and our conversation uh, unrolled in over time, and how we came to. Uh, an installation rather than a photographic hmm. series. It is. Uh, a quite immersive installation uh, basically grounded on three different elements, which is a series of photographic prints, uh, a wallpaper which mm -hmm. is surrounding and creating basically the environment for the installation, and then a publication. Mm -hmm. So, what was your process? What was your thinking at the beginning of a project? Okay, so uh, the idea after the very short uh, briefing we made was, um, for me, uh, how can I predict what art will be in the future and eventually what a biennial will be showing in the future. So I came back to very basic um, conceptions of art, like the popular ones, what, I mean, the things that, uh, where is originality, that there is a cycle, mm. just like with fashion, that ideas come from previous ideas, that come from previous ideas, etc. So it's all cyclic. So I decided in terms of the artwork to recycle the artwork that was done in previous editions. And the best way to do it, eventually, was to use the installation shots, which would raise the, raise the debate on what is, like, if I, I am raising, upgrading the status of uh, installation shots into art because that's the new art uh, that was in one side on the other side um, then how people like the general public understand art because that is something that when I studied uh, fine arts myself I was very aware of that mm. there is a, sometimes a very big distance between what the artists say especially contemporary artists and what the audience gets it's very difficult to decipher sometimes so I just took the headlines of newspapers which is the bridge between the artist and the audience yeah. and how they simplify things and how they just look for the headlines and how they just try to um, build a scandal. There's always like a, a piece, an artwork that nobody likes, uh, one that everybody likes, everybody thinks that my five-year-old daughter could do the same and it's too expensive. You know like the big cliches on how the audience normally, like the general audience, mm -hmm. gets art. So I just uh, found in the, in the archives of the Biennial the, the headlines that I thought could resume that simplification that the media have been doing during all these years and adapt it to what I wanted to say. So again, uh, modifying reality to what I need to say, which is uh, part of that grey zone where I'm very sure. comfortable. So uh, yes, it has a bit of everything that I'm interested in and that I'm working on the moment. It's like the media, how we write about, how we simplify things, how you can manipulate texts and how you can, which is actually what the media is doing <laughs> too. So yes, and then the publication because uh, we, we, we did, we, I mean, we've, we've done a newspaper, which makes sense because it's like massive distribution and it's also because of my background because the books I make become immediately collector's pieces and, and it's like gone crazy as a book which is meant to be a massive distribution object mm, sure. uh, becomes like unique rare specimen so doing 2,000 of them 
and they are all unique because they are all censored again. Uh, it's it's playing what with what art is and how we understand it and how this dynamic relations there are between the audience, the artist, and the people who are supposed to explain and facilitate that conversation between the artist and the audience. Mm -hmm. That is a media. And so, of course, the the process they are describing. It basically involves immediately notions and ideas of authorship and ownership um, and of course kind of brings back to the fore uh, the idea of appropriation which has been you know a big driver in contemporary art for many years now and but still is a sticky point which apparently hasn't been resolved so maybe in order just to summarize for the benefit of, mm -hmm. uh, of the audience it your research through the archive of the Baino uh, and your um, selection of installation shots, which you have been then collaging in new forms mm -hmm. in order to imagine what the future of the Baino could have been, naturally entangled you know, using somebody else's photographs. And these photographs happen to be installation shots, which means you know, within the image there were somebody else's work it's uh, that it was depicted. pictures of representation. So exactly. represents, yeah. yeah, it's complicated. And so, <laughs> in terms of ownership, it actually posed some very interesting questions because, of course, we went all through the process and the first uh, authorization, so to speak, to ask for was actually the biennial itself because they have to, you know, enable us to use the image that they themselves commissioned mm -hmm. uh, to document their own history. And then, of course, we have to get in touch with the photographers who, through the years, have been taking those images. And then, additionally, we want to get in touch with the artist whose work was represented in those photographs in order to make sure that all parts involved they were aware of the process. And in a way, we were asking permission to sabotage you know, their own history or the way they wanted to be represented. And some very interesting conversation arose from there. Mm -hmm. So it seemed that the biennial, the institution, was fine with us manipulating their own history. The photographers who made the photographs, they was uh, fine with the idea that their photographs had been They're reassembled. Nice They're, They're nice, nice people. people. <laughs> <laughs> reassembled and reconfigured in a different way as far as they were credited. But then when it came to the artist whose work was in the picture, we found out that there was a quite strong resistance, which was surprising to me because artists in the you know are the first one to use appropriation very freely and very often. And it is a biennial and it's not a work that is in a gallery, it's work that has already been shown a lot and accessible and that was accessible to a whole city and to a lot of visitors so it's just taking again a bit of it and making it public again so it's not that and there was no commercial benefit from it either so which was sure. a strong point too so but we did have like you know i think that there were two different elements to it the first one was of course legal because you know we didn't want to incur in any legal issue but there was another element which, I, to, to me, being a curator, was as important, which was a sort of ethical, moral issue, which is like, you now I didn't want to upset people I've been working with, because mm -hmm. I was also curating the biennial and some of the biennials uh, that they are uh, represented here. And so we really were like, you now arriving to a point where we didn't want to create an unnecessary scandal, I think, or an unnecessary commotion around the project, but at the same time we wanted to retain our own freedom mm -hmm. of speech, so to speak. Mm. And so we came up, or you came up with a we, very different... We. Uh, it's been a teamwork, you know that. <laughs> a very different idea, which is basically what is surrounding us. I think, I think we've been uh, lucky and actually encouraged by the obstacles. We found to, if we had just stick to the first intention, it wouldn't have been as interesting as I think it is now. Uh, we had to find a solution to not to get into problems, legal problems and also moral problems, as you say. And, and, and yes, I mean, what we did is to censor, uh, to remove the art that there, you can see in the picture. So use a representation without the art as an art form if that makes any sense. It does. I mean, it does. It does, looking <laughs> at the picture. Uh, but it, it's kind of interesting because you basically retain the outline of the artworks. So if you are familiar with the context and if you have been experiencing firsthand the, those very same artworks, of course you can immediately recognize 
what they are hmm. in yep. a way, but because they are all collaged together. But that's the tricky part of exactly. censoring that yeah, exactly. uh, you're not showing, but by hiding, you're you, making you're, more you, evidence exactly. that it needs to be hidden. So yes, it's the it's a it's a tricky one, and and it's a way of making everybody happy in a way, if not super happy, but at least. No upset in them. Not upset that much. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's kind of true because it's also like, you know, by, uh, by hiding your unveil mm -hmm. in a way. And you know, I think we've been almost unconsciously unveiling uh, one of the issues, with, as I was mm. saying, that I don't think has been yet resolved, where, you know, w in terms of fair use of images, how far can you go and who is actually ultimately the judger of that you know, fair use? Yes, and especially with the uh, installation shots, because I've been myself, I have been documenting fairs like Arco and, and maybe a couple more, and they want your artistic approach as a photographer. They want your eye, your angle, your perspective, your maybe your... Uh, capacity to get close to people and be invisible. I think they want that. They don't want post pictures. So in a way they're using your skills and your creativity as a photographer, just a mechanical tool as a photographer. But then you're making you're creating something. You're creating out of the, in the same way as you have a tree there and you take a beautiful picture of the sure. tree. Who's whose credit is to be given to the gardener who planted the tree, to the person who decided that a tree needed to be there, or to the photographer that comes and waits for the good light and for something to happen to make a picture. So I think it's a very, very interesting debate. Mm. And I, I, I mean, I was personally um, very implicated in that in previous uh, parts of my life. So yeah, it's funny to play with that now. Great. I think that's, uh, that's it, folks. Yep. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>